Hey everybody, this is George from DinosaurGeorge.com. Let's go. Um, Anki from Columbus, Ohio writes, my name is Anki. It's pronounced like a hanky, but without the H. <laughs> Thanks for saying that because I would have pronounced it Ankit. It's spelled A-N-K-I-T. Uh, when I was younger, I actually used to spell my name A-N-K-Y. Then I discovered a dinosaur that was clearly named after me without giving me credit. <laughs> That's good. That's really good. Uh, in any case, I've been reading about Ankylosaurus, which I think should have uh, have been pronounced closer to Hanky instead of Unky. You're right. Some people pronounce it Ankylosaurus. I don't. I pronounce it Ankylosaurus. But when you're pronouncing dinosaur names, there's not necessarily a right or wrong way. It's like pronouncing Caribbean or Caribbean, um, which is correct. Well, just depends on what your particular dialect is. So I have always pronounced it uh, Ankylosaurus, like, like your name, Anki. So I guess now I have to pay you money, right, for using your name all these years? All right. <laughs> I want to ask two questions. Uh, number one, how do I learn more? Are journal articles where I can get more information? Obviously, they lived a long time ago, but I don't know too much about them and would like to learn more. Well, there's a number of different ways you can get good information about Ankylosaurus. Probably the best descriptions I've ever seen and information about Ankylosaurus comes from Dr. Ken Carpenter, who is in Denver. Um, if you look up, I believe Dr. Carpenter's written a number of books, some of them on ceratopsiums, but I also have seen a lot of stuff he's done about Ankylosaurus. He really knows a lot about them. I would say that doing, doing a, a, um, a search for Dr. Ken Carpenter is a great way to open the doors to give you more information about Ankylosaurus. He's a great guy, too. He's a very nice man. Uh, as a fan of dinosaurs, I have searched online, and some people claim to be selling parts of Ankylosaurus. I'm skeptical of these bones because I have no way of verifying it and whether or not they are uh, rare to begin with. Any advice on finding collector's items, or should I stick to nice posters, books, and toys? Thanks, Anki. Anki, um... I get a lot of people that email me images of things that they want to buy, like off of eBay and stuff like that. I will say for the most part, most of the things that are there that are being sold as ankylosaurus parts are true ankylosaurus parts. But listen, man, unless you physically hold it and look at it up close, there is no way you can say with 100% certainty what you're looking at is authentic bone. And then second, whether or not it actually goes to ankylosaurus. There's really only one thing that I can say, two things that I could say you could find that would tell you 100% it's Ankylosaurus. One would be the club tail, the other would be armored scoots from its back. But you'd have to know where they come from because there's other animals with, with armored scoots. Um, and most of the Ankylosaurus had them. I would say, if you ever find something that you like, if you will go to the Dinosaur George website, dinosaurgeorge.com, and go to the Contact Us button, you can send a picture of what it is you're thinking about, and I'll do my best, if I have time, to look at it and give you my opinion, but there's still no way I could say with any certainty. I would say to be safe, always buy replicas, because then you're not depleting the natural source, and then you're, you know you're getting a copy of something, because people that make replicas Almost all of them uh, have their um, reputations on the line. They only cast things that they know where it comes from. All right, uh, Michael from South San Francisco, California. Hi, Dinosaur George. I'm a really big fan of yours, and I really admire your work. Thank you, Michael. That's very kind of you. My question is about a nightmarish creature named Sorophaganax. It is described as a massive Allosaurus. If this was true, would this make it a separate genus from Allosaurus or a same genus due to the similarities? Thanks for taking the time to look at the question and have a good day. Michael, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Um, there are enough differences between Sorophaganax and Allosaurus, in my opinion, to suggest that they are indeed two distinctively separate species, but they come from the same family. It is clear to me that Sorophaganax is an Allosaurid. These guys come from the same lineage, same family. Um, but there appears to be enough differences between them. The problem with Sorophaganax is not a lot has been found. So it limits us um, as to what we really know about this guy. But what we do know is that he's big. I always think about this. Um, we always talk about Tyrannosaurus and Giganotosaurus and those guys being the biggest. But to me, I think the Jurassic predators 
probably exceeded all other predators in size. And here's why I say that. During the Jurassic, you have the titans of the dinosaur world, the big sauropods. Most of the big sauropods are living during the Jurassic. So to me, it would make sense that we would also see most of the big predators living alongside of them. Now, that's not, you know, it doesn't equate to absolutes, but I believe that because the Jurassic is so far back and we don't have as many opportunities to find fossils from the Jurassic, I think there's some big predators still hidden out there. And I'll bet you Saurophaganax, in my opinion, was probably bigger than any of the big predators that we think of during the Cretaceous. Spinosaurus, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, Giganotosaurus, Maposaurus. I believe, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't one day discover that the biggest predatory dinosaurs on Earth lived during the late Jurassic and not the Cretaceous, and I think Saurophaganax would have topped the list as being a monstrosity. All right, um, Shazaib from Singapore. I think I pronounced that correctly. You even went so far as to show me the pronunciation. But uh, Shazaib, I, I think that's how you pronounce it, man. I hope it is. From Singapore, hello, Mr. Blassing. I have followed you, your work closely ever since the airing of Jurassic Fight Club on the History Channel. And may I say that I've become a huge fan of yours. That's very, very polite of you. Thank you so much. You don't need to call me Mr. Blassing, although I, I really appreciate that kind of respect. But you're more than welcome to call me George, Dinosaur George, DG, whatever you want. Well, not whatever you want, but <laughs> make it decent. But uh, anyway, thank you. That's very uh, polite of you. My question is, did large sauropods like Argentinosaurus that were preyed upon by large carnivores like Giganotosaurus have feathers or hair or any sort of today's, or any sort uh, of hair? Most carnivores get their fiber requirements from the fur or feathers of their prey. Ooh. Uh, so this is good. This is a good question. So basically saying for the dietary requirements, would it be possible that, that herbivores had feathers or hair? Wow. Have a nice day and thank you very much for answering my question. The world needs more people like you. That is incredibly polite of you, brother. That's very polite of you. But let me tell you something, man. What the world really needs is more people like all of you guys. Because the letters and emails I get from all of you guys are so incredibly polite and respectful. You guys make the world a better place. I just help it along a little bit. What an incredibly insightful question. Did herbivores have feathers or something like that and the carnivores would have been able to benefit from eating them. Wow. Okay. I did see uh, when I was in South Dakota, uh, I saw the uh, skin impressions of a triceratops. Actually, it was the mummified skin of a triceratops. And it appears that there were connection points where feathers would have attached to this thing. Now, not complete body feathers like a bird, but it appeared like more like the big quills of an ostrich where they may have had flowing feathers on them. Now, when you get up into the sauropods, feathers probably wouldn't have been as necessary because they're so gigantic. Losing heat may have been a problem in feathers. They wouldn't want any sort of insulation. But is it possible that some of the other dinosaurs did? Well, yeah, that's certainly a possibility. And would predators benefit from that? Yes. But here's what most predatory animals today get there. Uh, get, get a shot of vitamins and a shot of roughage, it's actually from eating the stomach of whatever they kill. You know, we talk about animals being carnivores and herbivores. In actuality, almost every carnivore on earth is at one time an omnivore because they eat the material within the stomach cavity of whatever they kill, therefore ingesting plants. Um, the reason why they don't just go out and eat leaves is because they don't have the bacteria necessary to break it down. But when you eat the grass and the plant material in the stomach of your prey, and that prey happens to be an herbivore, they do have the bacteria. And so the process of breaking it down has already begun, making it a little more easier for your digestive system to break down the remainder. So predatory dinosaurs would have been the same in my opinion. They would have actively gone out and hunted and killed prey and then eaten the insides, eating all the internal organs and whatever was in the stomach cavity. And that's more likely of how they would have gotten those kind of nutrients. Now, if they had feathers, yes, I do think some of the predators would have even eaten those. But I believe they probably would have spent more time focusing on what was inside than on the outside. But that is a great question, man. All right, Christian from, I think this is Laufen, Bavaria, Germany. Hello, Mr. Plastic. It's a pleasure to see you back on YouTube, brother. It's great to be back. It is great. Well, I say brother, Christian. You could also, uh, Christian sometimes is a name for girls, so I better not say brother. Uh, <laughs> Christian, thank you very much. It's good to be back. 
One question, is it possible that a change in photon radiation could have led to the extinction of dinosaurs simply because of the changes of DNA? Because when you let, a, when you let the flow of a certain photon radiation through eggs, one from a chicken and another from a lizard, the eggs change. This could be another interesting theory, isn't it? Blessings to you, Christian. Thank you very much, Christian. Yes, it is a very interesting theory. Is it possible that something from space other than an asteroid caused the extinction of the dinosaurs? Absolutely. Things like gamma ray bursts have tremendous impact on life for hundreds of billions of miles away from it because of the power and the energy that it emits. Who was it? Who was it? Dr. Larry Martin. Love that guy. He's in Kansas, University of Kansas. Dr. Martin suggests that the big extinction at the Devonian may have been a gamma ray burst. And that he also suggests that other extinction, mass extinctions in our history were caused by something other than an actual impact of an asteroid. It could be possible that the asteroid impact was the last of a lot of bad things. It could have been possible that gamma ray bursts would have caused that. You know, when you look at the weird assortment of dinosaurs and you look at how odd some of them are, it kind of makes you wonder if it's not possible that we got some of those oddballs because of things like gamma ray burst or um, radiation having an impact and maybe altering the DNA enough to where you get kind of an oddity. I can't, there's absolutely no way to prove that to my knowledge, but it is an interesting concept and I do think it's a very interesting theory, Christian, and I appreciate you thinking outside the box. Dustin from Buda, Texas. Hey, DG, my friend is, uh, it's great to have you back making videos. They bring such joy. Thank you, Dustin. Very, very polite of you, my friend. Sir, I was wondering about the size of Ed Marka. I see lots of material on him, but never a straight estimate on size. Do we have enough remains to make a good guess? And do you, what do you think of the theory that he may have been a synonym of Torvosaurus? Thank you for your time and blessed always. Thank you, Dustin. Great to hear from you. Um, Ed Marka is an oddity because they didn't find much of him, but what they did find, I think Bacher found him, or was, is, is associated with them. I just remember that much. Um, it's big. Whatever it is, it's big. 30 to maybe 40 feet in length. But again, the problem with them is, and you hit the nail on the head, there's just not a lot of material to be able to know for certain how big he is. So it's a tough question. Is he Torvosaurus? Don't know. Don't know. Good question. Torvosaurus is very similar to him, so is he a Torvosaurus? Yikes, we just don't know, my friend. Um, hopefully one day they'll find more um, fossils of him and be able to help us understand exactly who he is. Finally, Drake from Sydney, Australia. In your opinion, which plant-eating dinosaurs had the best defense against predators? Wow. Good question, Drake. Who had the best defense? Well, you look at all of them. Everybody has a defense in one way or another. Um, defense sometimes can be weaponry, horns and spikes and clubs and that sort of stuff. Defense can also be sheer numbers. Uh, hadrosaurs, in my opinion, their defense was sheer numbers. They had a lot of members of the family, and when you're trying to attack a big group and they're all running, uh, and chances are they probably had some kind of spots or stripes on their skin, it would have made it difficult to figure out who's who, and so that alone would be a defense. Um, speed was a defense. Who had the best? My opinion would be, going back to my friend Anki, would be the ankylosaurs. I think those guys had incredible uh, weapons. Uh, those big armored plates on their back, the clubs on their tail, <gasps> Speaking about clubs on their tail, you guys want to see something cool? Do you? I figured you did. Guess what I got? Let me back this thing up a little bit. I got an Ankylosaurus club I want to show you guys. Oh, yeah. If I can pick them up. Oh, yeah, baby. Here it is. This is the club from the tail of Cycania. Now, let me tell you something. You take a swing with this thing, and you hit a dinosaur with this nasty mace, this thing is going to shatter the bones, absolutely shatter the bones of anything it comes in contact with. This tail is reinforced. I don't know if you guys can see this or not. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can get a tight shot of this. Here we go. You see these rods that run down the length of this thing? These rod, I look like a criminal. Give me the money. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, these bony rods interconnect. Look how they look how incredible they are. They interconnect with each other, and then of course you come down to the monster of all monsters. This thing, um, but uh, this would make an incredibly powerful weapon, a very effective weapon. And so my opinion would be that uh, the most well defended dinosaurs are the guys that carry around this thing on the end of the tail. That would be the ankylosauruses. And in my ugh, 
my opinion, those would be the most well-defended dinosaurs. But boy, you look at some of the Ceratopsians, brother, I wouldn't come close to them either. All right, you guys, that's it for now. If you've got a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page. While you're there, sign up to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Um, uh, make sure to take care of yourselves. Take care of the people around you. And as always, uh, I sincerely mean this. I appreciate very much all of the letters you guys send. I wish I could read them all. Uh, and I really appreciate your courtesy. And my only hope is that you take the courtesy you give me and you apply that to everybody else you come in contact with because, indeed, it does make the world a better place. Take care, everybody. See you soon. More surprises coming.